Good. Then welcome to this uh, new webinar of the Coal Regions in Transition Initiative, uh, where today we want to look a little bit beyond the coal mining and coal technologies and coal sectors, but look into another topic which is very important for coal regions, and that is the other companies, the other sectors that are working and providing jobs and economic prosperity for coal regions. Um, and with a specific focus on, on those uh, companies and industries that have high CO2 emissions, the energy intensive industries. And um, before I start, maybe a few words on the housekeeping. Um, for those who've joined as, as participants, you cannot unmute yourself or start your video. Um, you can listen, but if you want to provide us questions, uh, please put the questions in the chat. And I myself and the colleagues in the background, we will look at the questions and we'll try to uh, pick up those questions and address them to the speakers um, that we have. Um, the meeting will, will be recorded and we will provide the recording after the meeting. Um, and should you have a, a very technical question, it's probably easiest if you direct it uh, directly to Martin, if you uh, pick up in the chat the option to him personally, then if you have any troubles on technical issues, um, please do so. I see now we have uh, more than 30 participants. We've had uh, quite a few more registration from all of Europe. Um, um, I guess that a few more people will jump in, but I, I just would like to start in content um, so that we get as much out of this meeting as we can. Um, as I said, today is, is really on the broader economic base of, of coal regions. And, and what we see is that actually, um, yes, if we look at coal region, coal mining and coal fire power plants do provide jobs, but in many regions, carbon intensive industries provide many more jobs to the region, um, obviously other companies also. And uh, my colleague, uh, Janis, will give you a, a first glimpse on, on this issue and some more issues, um, and he will present uh, a new toolkit which we've developed. Um, some of you might already know it or parts of it. Uh, we've presented some things on hydrogen before, some things on um, repurposing of coal fire power plant, and Janus will go a little bit more into detail of energy intensive industry. Why I personally find this a very important topic is that because if you look at energy intensive industries like steel or chemical or cement or under other industries like that, um, there's a lot of investments needed for those industry to make the shift towards a zero carbon economy. And it's, it's very long investment cycles, right? It's long lead times. So if we want to become climate neutral by 2050, it is actually now that uh, companies new, do need to make the right investment. And the other thing is that, of course, a lot of it is decisions by companies, right? By the private sector, by businesses, but often they don't, of course, act on their own just by themselves, but it's, it's, they need to align with other companies in the region. Infrastructure for the region is important. And we want to go into that a bit of how does the region as a region need to collaborate? What is the role between the regional government, the regional administration, and the companies, what is research and companies, how do they work together? And uh, against this background, I'm very happy to have a speaker, uh, Mr. Wedige, who is uh, working at, at ThyssenKrupp as a steel company, but his view is a broader view of, of what is going on in Northern Westphalia and a very interesting initiative of um, innovation for climate, of um, the regional administration and businesses using climate mitigation innovation as, a, an, as an opportunity for innovation and investments into the region. And um, after this presentation, I'm very happy to have uh, Eugenia Ketas Gott uh, from Malopolska and, and mirroring that against uh, their experiences Eugenia uh, has in Malopolska region. Eugenia works for the Marshall's office, but I'll introduce the two speakers when they come up. So for now, um, as I said, put questions in the chat. We'll, uh, we'll look at the chat, we'll collect the questions as soon as I have it. And now I hand over to my colleague Janis, 
um, who will present uh, a new toolkit, which we have developed and some of the key insights from that toolkit. Janis, over to you. Well, I hope you can hear me now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm happy to present you some of the insights of our latest toolkit. So as you can see here on this overview, uh, we have currently, we have a lot of case studies already developed and in total five toolkits. Um, and yeah, the latest toolkits is on technology options um, where we take a look um, at uh, four different pillars. Martin, if you could click one further, please. Um, yeah, so we have like four thematic uh, pillars that we dive into, into that technology options toolkit. And the first one covers the technology options of repurposing and after use of coal fired power plants, um, which we already talked about at the last working group meeting of the coal regions in Tran transition initiative. Um, and the second section focuses a bit more on the decarbonization of energy intensive industries. And this is the part that we're talking about today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, in terms of relevance, uh, let's first take a look at the employment data of jobs in, in, in energy intensive industries. Um, and on this slide, you can see on the left, you have uh, the jobs in the energy intensive industries, on the right, the jobs in mining and querying. And as you can see, um, the jobs in energy intensive industries outnumber the jobs in mining, um, sometimes even double. They have like, uh, there are more than uh, double jobs in uh, energy intensive industries than in the mining in, in Europe. And that just shows uh, the, the relevance also for um, in, in terms of transition efforts, also for these industries to find solutions how to, uh, how to make the transition happening to a climate neutral economy until 2050. Um, next slide, please. Um, and in our toolkit, we, uh, in, first, in the first part of this section, we elaborate a bit on the challenges and the opportunities uh, of, of processes how to decarbonize energy intensive industries. And one of the main challenges is actually the very long investment cycles in many, in, in many of these energy intensive industries, um, especially in the steel, chemical and cement sectors. So if you take a look at the, uh, at the figure on the right side, um, you can see the technical lifetime of uh, production facilities for steel, chemical and cement sectors. And you see that um, that lifetime is about 50 to 70 years. So uh, if there's going to be a reinvestment happening in 2025, um, this will extend the 2050 limits. So actually it is already necessary now to invest in technologies that are climate neutral. Um, and obviously the problem here is that these new technologies are not yet fully there. Um, so there's also a need for new technologies and production processes. Um, however, right now there are still uh, under development and um, yeah, it's not yet that easy to just decide okay, we can just take this option or this option and um, then we're good to go. Um, on the other hand side, uh, making these investments now improve the competitiveness of businesses in the mid to long term. So it is actually very wise to still find some, some way and some way to deal with this uh, dilemma. Um, also to just hold the, the industrial jobs in the region in the end um, and keep pro prosperity um, and, and these, these industrial processes in the regions where they now are. Um, yeah, and now we're gonna take a look at the, at the steel production as one of the energy intensive industries uh, where, we basically have, uh, where we basically have three options. So the first one is a direct reduction with hydrogen and smelting in the electric arc furnace. And this actually has the highest CO2 reduction potential 
but it requires a lot of hydrogen and in turn also a lot of renew new renewable energy to provide this uh, green hydrogen in the best case. Um, and uh, the second option is here an alkaline iron electrolysis uh, that still also have quite a high CO2 reduction potential uh, and it only needs electricity for production. So therefore this is, uh, it's more efficient. Um, however, yet it's not market ready and it will be most likely too late from, from our perspective to still play a major role in the transition. Um, however, it's still quite a good option to keep an eye uh, looking at uh, over time. And the third option then is the CO2 capture and utilization, CCU of waste gases. Um, and with that technology already existing, uh, production facilities can be retrofitted and it's expected that these technologies can be applied for relatively soon. Um, but it, in the end, it has a lower CO2 reduction potential and it is more energy intensive. So as I said before, what, what accounts to uh, generally to the, uh, to the energy intensive industry processes that also applies to the steel production itself. So we kind of see here a dilemma of three different technologies where one seems to be more promising, but it's not yet market ready. And um, yeah, on the other hand side, we do have the pressure to make uh, um, some decisions soon to get ready um, to decarbonize the energy intensive industries in time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but for all of these, um, actually, there are already projects uh, underway. In our toolkit, we uh, elaborate a bit on these further, uh, where we just give examples on where and, and how uh, some, some projects are already going with these different technologies. Um, and next slide, please. And um, yeah, so overall uh, the process is underway and mostly it's going to be a decision about which technology are we gonna choose for steel. And I think this, this graph actually shows one of the biggest arguments um, how to proceed further. And that is about the estimated CO2 abatement costs of future steel technologies. And here we can see that the direct reduction with hydrogen actually provides um, the lowest abatement costs and by far. So this actually looks like it's quite a clear decision which way could be the best. But as I said earlier here, we need a lot of hydrogen. So for regional development and thinking now about what we want to talk today uh, in our workshop, it's going to be, um, there go, there's going to be also the uh, regional planning and strategy making that seems necessary to push these technologies and production processes in the right direction. Um, next slide, please. So when we're thinking about, oh, we do want to do the direct reduction with hydrogen, then we would also take, uh, then we would need uh, some sort of hydrogen strategy making. And this is what we also took, a, a, that that's something that we also elaborated in our toolkit on how regional uh, strategy making could work. And there's this example from Northern Netherlands. They already put out, um, yeah, a first example and, and first uh, a first draft of this uh, regional hydrogen strategy. And for regional decision makers from our side, it really needs to um, take into account three questions, which is the first one, what is the hydrogen demand? Um, what is the potential for producing clean hydrogen? And at last, what kind of infrastructure do we need for that? Um, and so, yeah, it's not only about private uh, actor um, um, possibilities, but also about regional actors working together and developing together a new way on how to decarbonize, uh, decarbonize energy intensive industries. So yeah, looking forward uh, what we're going to hear now from our next speakers. 
And this is from me, thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you for that uh, quick uh, presentation. Of course, it's, it is difficult to go into technical details in very much detail in, in such a short time, but I think it's important for, for regional decision makers to have some, at least some vague idea of what technological options are, despite all the uncertainties we have in pathways when we're talking about the next 30 and 50 years. Um, so that we have a sense of what are the requirements for, for regions and what are requirements that a company by itself cannot take on its own, but that needs to be embedded in, in a bigger picture. With that, I would like to hand over to our next speaker, who is uh, Hans-Jan Wedige uh, from ThyssenKrupp. Uh, uh, Mr. Wedige, you're head of climate fund strategies at the Center of Decarbonization at uh, ThyssenKrupp. You're, of course, an expert on, on steel, steel making. ThyssenKrupp, uh, like other steel companies, is obviously thinking of uh, how to become carbon neutral and, and go that pathway. That would be interesting. But as I said, what I'll be very interested is here of, to hear from you of what are you doing in North from Westphalia? How, how do you interact as companies in the regions? What is behind the Info Climate Initiative? And, and how do you bring companies and other stakeholders in the region together. And um, with that, um, over to you, Mr. Wittigan. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the introduction. And I will try, as indicated, uh, to give you the um, different views. Why do we start with Info Climate? Because one thing I think is very important, what we have actually to do is nothing we can do alone. It's not we as in Tyson Krupp only, it's not we as a North from Westphalia, it's not we as in any other company. It's really important to realize we have to work together on that. And this is what's very important. How do you actually build fora for stakeholders of all different uh, kinds? And this is what we tried with Info Climate in North from Westphalia. We tried to build up a joint initiative of industry, science, and the state, the regional state of North and West failure, because we believe it's important that we work as stakeholders together. You will immediately recognize there are many stakeholders which are not involved. For those, yes, there are other for us. It's not to exclude someone, but it's in order to make sure that we keep it at a level which is broad enough that it brings value, and at the same time, it's small enough so that you have a trustful and fruitful cooperation. What do we want to stand for? We want to stand for something that's innovative. We really look at what's bringing the region forward. It's interdisciplinary because we find very often that it's not just about the technical issue. It's not just about the commercial issues. It might be uh, things about legal issues, planning. Um, we had the example just a minute ago about hydrogen infrastructure. There are a lot of issues that are about social acceptance, about how do we get people to know more about it and be agreeing that we change infrastructure. It certainly is industrial. We have deliberately put an emphasis on the energy intensive and therefore particularly climate relevant industries. And it is also about, as I will say in a moment, about keeping industry. It's not about replacing industry by something, but by it's about transforming industry. Therefore, we believe we are very well suited, certainly, for what we have here. And it should be international. International because, as I said, we can't do it alone. And if you look at the map, you will see North from Westphalia is bordered by two other European states. And it's really in the heart of uh, Europe in the sense of that our economic connections are all about Europe, uh, our workers, our people come from all about Europe, and therefore we would really like to be also a model, model region for that uh, going forward. Why is that? Because it is, as I said, about securing the long-term future for North West failure and for North West failure as a key center for industry. Um, and not by saying, okay, we just close our borders, we do whatever we like. No, but with clearly committing to and contributing to the Paris Agreement and making sure that we, as a, one of the most heavily industrialized parts of the world, are really showing, yes, it is possible. In terms of InfoClimate and NRV, we consider ourselves to be really a think tank. 
a think tank where we are certainly looking at what is latest R&D available, what are strategies and solutions we can discuss. We certainly, and this was something that was mentioned in passing, and we could spend a whole afternoon on it, looking at the funding issue. Networking, as I mentioned, is extremely important because no one has all the answers, but a lot of people might have enough answers. And we also certainly, um, it's not about a closed shop, as I said, it's really about developing a forward-looking narrative about really saying what's the vision for North Westphalia and public relations to get it going and also to certainly discuss it. For that, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into who is actually part of it. And the main focus at the moment is really, as I said, primary energy intensive industries. Uh, if you're energy intensive, you need energy providers and grid operators because the energy needs to come from somewhere. Industry associations also in order to make sure that we really have a widespread and it's not just a few companies accidentally in the initiative, uh, but that we really cover as much of North Westphalia as possible. It's not only about the old and established industries such as mine, which is for over 200 years in the region, but it's at the same time about startups and SMEs, because at the end of the day, as I said, we need the whole ecosystem, the whole value chain and certainly about the organized civil society, which is not so much part um, of the initiative, but it's extremely important to have the link because at the end of the day, what do we need is really social acceptance for the way forward on all levels. What we would like to do is to create that vision of a climate neutral and resource saving primary industry, as I will show in the second part, it's not an either or, but it's about both at once. For that, not only saying, yes, it's possible and we pray for it and hope it will happen, but really what are the roadmaps, the strategies to show that it's working? Um, be a competence hub and a hub not only for the industry with the Northwest, yeah, but we are reaching out certainly and we are very willing to share the information wherever it's needed in order to make sure that other companies, other regions, other societies do participate. And that's the reason why we certainly also are involved in issues like what are the appropriate policies on the different levels? What do we need as a framework? And as I said, make sure that we really see it as a blueprint. It cannot just be copied and paste, we believe. But if you study the blueprint properly, make a few alterations here and there, we strongly believe that it can be applied in many other regions as well. We are looking at the moment at things not so surprising. Hydrogen just mentioned the policy framework, circular economy of all different kinds of materials, narratives, the CO2 economy, heat. Uh, so many things that are really needed. And as you can see a little bit from the screenshot, it's really about working together. Working together, certainly also working together in terms of main partners being uh, industry federations and industrial companies themselves. You have a screenshot here of who is on board and you see some of them are really international names as well. Some of them you might not heard about because they're really regional and that's the important split we need because at the end of the day, it's important that we all together do it and do our contribution. And with that, I would like to um, hand a change to the focus of what are we at Tussen Group actually doing? What's our contribution towards um, the transition towards the change? So if you come to that, one thing's very important. Let me start with what it's not about. It's not about the end of industry. It's not about let's just get rid of everything. It's really about structural change. However, if we look at examples for structural change, let's look at the former steel plant in Rheinhausen at the banks of the River Rhine in Duisburg. That's how it looked like in the 70s. That's how it looks like today. One of the most important lock ports, a very important logistics infrastructure. Let's look um, at the steel plant we had in Oberhausen, the former Thyssen Niederrhein one. This is how it looked like in the 50s uh, as an aerial photo. This is how it looks like today, Centro, a shopping area with really not only regional, but uh, uh, a circle of customers stretching far into the Netherlands. 
these are examples of structural change, but this is not the structural change we would like to speak about because this is the largest steel plant we have um, in, in Duisburg. Uh, this is the one where we are operating at the moment and very important, we want to continue to operate there because we strongly believe it's not about industry disappearing, it's about industry adopting. Why? Because industry we strongly believe is needed. It's not needed for its own. It's needed because the services, the products, the technologies it produces are actually uh, made because they are a necessity for society. And it's on society's demands that we do things. And therefore, certainly, if we now have a demand, be climate friendly, be climate neutral as soon as you can, this is certainly something we need to adopt to as well and we are very willing to do. I could go at length into how you can do that in steel and I could, uh, I'm very, very tempted to, to have a, an intensive metallurgical debate on the few things that were proposed. However, let me restrict to some of the things we are doing and let me focus on something which was mentioned already, hydrogen. So how can we use hydrogen? What you see here is a classical way of uh, iron making, later than steel making, we are have been applying in many of the coal intensive industries for uh, sometimes two and a half uh, centuries, if you look into the uh, English regions, um, because coal was an important carrier for iron making, because you need coke uh, at the top, you need coal in recent uh, decades uh, to be injected, so that at the end of the day, together with iron ore, you get the hot metal out of the bottom. However, the problem is you get a lot of CO2 out at the top. So. First, what we do is hydrogen injection in blast furnaces. Rather than injecting coal, we inject hydrogen. Why do we do that? We know it's not a perfect uh, approach. We know it's uh, somewhere between 20%, 30% maximum perhaps of CO2 reduction. But as Janus Bottle mentioned, we have very, very long equipment times. Hence, if you have an equipment that's going to work yet for another uh, 15 years or so or longer, why don't you at least try to reduce its footprint even if you can't remove it? So for us, that's very important as an intermediate technology. One thing that was mentioned was um, the issue of uh, carbon to chem, the use of uh, CO2, because the CO2 together with hydrogen again, can actually become a very important raw material for lots of the chemical industry, the fertilizer industries and others, because at the end of the day, all the chemistry, not all, but most of the chemistry we need today, we use today is carbon based and no one is expecting that to change. What we do expect to change is a carbon source from fossil sources to other sources. And why don't we reuse at least the CO2 so therefore the 50% efficiency, by the way, that was mentioned for carbon to chem can be increased with every loop we do again and use it again and again and again. However, uh, we really want to look at what happens in the future. How can we really get away from the approach we have? So away from coal, but definitely not away from industry. For that, certainly as it was mentioned, the hydrogen direct uh, reduction plant with a melting unit. You might be surprised why am I suddenly speaking about a melting unit and not an electric arc furnace as it was presented because we believe we have um, here some challenges because with the electric arc furnaces at least as they operate today, we cannot produce whatever we need. So what we're doing is, yes, we have a direct reduction plant. So as uh, it has been proposed and used many times uh, around the globe, where basically like in a blast furnace uh, you use iron ore but instead of coal carbon uh, you are now using hydrogen however that in itself we believe is not enough we have actually been coupling us with a green electricity driven melting unit so to ensure that what we get out of that is a hot metal that's exactly the same as it was from the blast furnace why is that this is because as I said, we don't do steel for the sake of making steel. This is a classical integrated steel production and um, don't worry to go throughout the technical steps. 
very important is why do we do it? We do it because we believe high quality steels are indispensable for climate protection and transformation towards a climate neutral society. And this is why we have this elaborate chain. However, the front end is the one where the CO2 emissions come from. They come from the coke plants, they come from the blast furnaces. And this is exactly where we believe we need to make a change. We don't need to make a change at the right hand side, we make a change here. We have to get rid of the coke plants, blast furnaces over time. In order to do that, as I mentioned, we would be going for a direct reduction plant, a melting unit, because that and exactly that allows us to go back into the steel plant and to continue exactly the route we have been using, which means, first of all, a lot of what we have as infrastructure remains. A lot of what is there in the regions can be continued to use. We have a lot of reduction in investment in capitals and let's face it, most of uh, the steel regions, the steel companies are not necessarily those that are so uh, rich in cash today that they can just rebuild themselves. So therefore it's very important to keep uh, the capital invested in place as well as the metallurgical things because the quality of steel is determined in these green underlying processes. And steel is not steel. You have thousands of different grades and we want to make sure at the end of the day, we really go where we need to go to high quality grades because, uh, and that's important, steel will not disappear. We are speaking about electrification. Um, I do not believe for technical reasons very much in the electrolysis of iron ore, reason being, I mean, within the ThyssenKrupp group, we have a very important electrolysis business. We are one of the largest producers of water electrolytic plants in the world. However, there are some technicalities we could discuss at length, perhaps uh, later in the discussion, why with iron ore, it's much more difficult to see an economic future for that. However, we do see electrical steels Electrical steels are not those made from electricity, but are those needed for electricity. Take your bicycle. You have a dynamo which may uh, turns motion into electricity. The same actually you have in a wind turbine. Uh, you have transformers in order to bring electricity to different uh, levels. You have motors later to turn electricity back into motion. All of that works on uh, magnetic, ferromagnetic principles, and they are called ferromagnetic because they are based on ferrous, what we call steel today. So there are many applications we believe it's essential, and that's the reason why we at Tyson Group Steel Europe have said what we need is a clear roadmap forward. You see on the top hand part is the hydrogen um, carbon direct avoidance base with injection and blast furnaces, DR plants, melting units, <coughs> excuse me, and so on. On the bottom face, it's a carbon to chem route using CO2, using hydrogen on the way. We have a few other things certainly in order to bring us forward, but I hope this gives you at least a little bit of an insight into what do we do as a company. And I hope you remember from the first part of the presentation, this is not something we can do on our own, but we do it in an ecosystem with other companies, with the state, with society at large, with research institutes, with all different kinds of disciplines, because at the end of the day, that's what we are about, to remain an important region and to remain a competitive region, because at the end of the day, we would really like to go that, to go that way forward, not just to 25, but far beyond. Thank you very much for your attention so far. Thank you, Mr. Wedeke, for that uh, very, yeah, I, I find uh, inspiring presentation because you stretch from a very macro satellite view of, of uh, regional development into, into really the details of steelmaking, which I, as a, as a physicist, enjoy the technical debate, and I, I, I would love to continue the technical debate. But I think what, what, is, what is key is, is to understand that there is obviously technical options, different technical options, uh, certain certainties and uncertainties of, of how to view those technical options. And of course, um, I don't know, framework conditions you as, as a company uh, need to, to operate in. 
Um, I found it very impressive, your pictures of, of those, um, basically our furnace is being torn down and, and you say this is not the option, but it, the idea is to keep the industry in the region and uh, not only the steel making, but in general, keep industry in the region that's, that holds true for, for Europe in general and many of the coal regions and industrial regions. Um, may I ask you a, a critical question? In the beginning, when you presented InfoClimate, it sounded like all the companies are euphoric to do uh, climate mitigation. It's, it's, it's uh, sometimes when I read news, I, I, it feels like companies need to be dragged to do something to, to uh, bring down their CO2 emissions. It, it is a very different picture from what you present. Is that because you're presenting it to us and me and you want to, I don't know, uh, present something nice or do you, do you really have the feeling there is, there is a, a different attitude within the companies? Um, first of all, you have certainly to say what you find within uh, InfoClimate is if you like a positive pre-selection. <laughs> You're not joining an organization that aims to really make the change happening if you don't believe in it. Um, then certainly you always have to see what context are you looking at. Um, the fact that we are euphoric and believe we can do it doesn't mean we think it's easy. We have a lot mm -hmm. of issues we didn't discuss here. We have the issue, for example, that it's really about what's the framework conditions. Hydrogen availability, affordability, these things we have not discussed at all. And they certainly are points to be raised and to be critical about certain developments. So yes, uh, for me, it's not a, not a problem to at the same time say, yes, I'm very much in favor of that transition, but I'm outspoken and critically saying some things don't work. However, you have to address them uh, in order to remove the obstacles, not in order to hide behind the barriers and hope you're not uh, able to move because nobody will be pushing you. No, that's not the way you have to go forward. And that's what we strongly believe. Yeah, thank you. One, for, one for, note, for however, um, I said, um, I gave you two examples, which I think are quite important because if you look at it, the two steel plants that were torn down and replaced by something else, they exactly stand for what's the reason what to keep the third one. The shopping center, the issue of people having jobs, having money, being able to spend is at least in North and Westphalia, particularly in the rural district, very much depending on the industrial back backbone and well-paid jobs. Equally, the connection to the world for us is important. So the logistics port that doesn't only serve the shopping center, but the whole of the industry is very important. So it's not about just keeping something for the sake of keeping it, but making sure you still have all the parts you need because without the steel plant, you wouldn't have the money to buy in the shopping center and you wouldn't have the customer to get the stuff that comes into the lock port. Good. I, thank you, Mr. Wittiger. I'll, I'll try to zoom over and, and uh, Bozena, please please uh, turn on your camera and join in the, in the discussion. And Mr. Wittiger, just stay online. Um, uh, maybe to introduce you, Bozena Peter Goss, you're a senior expert at the Department of Sustainable Development at the Marshall Office of Malopolska Region. For colleagues who, who are back in geography as I am, most of us coal nerds know Silesia as the, as the big coal region, and mm -hmm. Malopolska is just east of, of uh, Silesia, right? And the western part of Malopolska is also a coal region, has steel plants, has a lot of energy intensive industry. Um, I, yeah, maybe to discuss with you, when, when you hear, on the one hand, when you hear what Mr. Verge is presenting of the activities in North Westphalia, mm -hmm. um, what, is, what are you discussing currently with, um, with the companies in your region? Uh, how far are the companies in the region of um, preparing for a, a zero carbon economy? You said when we discussed uh, before this uh, webinar, you said you've done a survey uh, among the companies. Uh, what, what are the results of, of the survey? What, what, what do you think is, is, yeah, are the challenges or what is the level of awareness also mm -hmm. in, in the companies in your region of what needs to be done? Okay, thank you. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, as you said, I come from Małopolska, which is the region uh, east of Silesia, which everybody knows in the cold business, let's say. Uh, some of you may also uh, connect it to the city of Krakow, which is the capital and the metropolitan area of the, of the region. And not so far from the western part of Małopolska, which is very much functionally collect, uh, connected still to the to the Silesian region, let's say, because historically that was the same area. Yes, the administrative borders are the administrative borders only, and functionally it's in fact one organism still. Uh, so there is quite a lot of uh, heavy industry there, but there are no steel work. Uh, in this western part of Małopolska, we still do have some uh, um, plants uh, processing zinc and aluminium, which is a little bit different type of business, and also not so big and not so intensive from, from the point of view, of, for example, of, of consuming the space and visibility in the in the region. Uh, but also there are uh, there are quite many other large uh, energy intensive companies as well as very very large uh, population of small and medium sized enterprises which is one of the specifically Mao Polska I would say characteristics people usually are quite entrepreneurial here uh, and only if they can they just set up their businesses and run it, yes. Um, large part of it, micro and small, some of them also medium size, quite, let's say, getting mature. And so what we, um, what we do now in the context of um, preparing the, from the regional point of view, uh, from the strategic planning point of view, because that's the topic you, you assigned to me, let's say, what we do with the enterprises in the region is we started the discussion only, yeah? And feeling as, as I told you also in, in the talk before, as a general uh, preparing for a war, which we really do not know, but we only have the old weapons, we, we decided that for the beginning, we have to have a good intelligence and hence started to talk to the companies about, uh, first of all, their awareness, secondly, what or in how, in what way they do prepare for the energy transformation or climate transformation. And secondly, and thirdly, we also uh, decided to make a pretty wide survey on, on the whole population of the companies in the region. The, the Western Małopolska region is about half a million people, that's the size, and about 50, several thousand companies. So that's the population. And we did it this spring. Okay, th there are a lot of uh, different results which might not be very interesting for you right now, but one of them is uh, very crucial, I think, for, for the policy making and the further development uh, that out of the whole population, only 12% of the companies told us, answer, uh, that uh, they already have the vision of change, that they aim uh, to the climate neutrality and that they really have already developed a kind of comprehensive uh, um, multi-dimensional program of change of the company and its processes and quite often also some diversification in products and clients but, um, somehow foreseeing the changes so that means uh, that all the rest which is 88% of the companies, um, by number, of course, not by size, uh, is not ready yet. And that's a huge, huge challenge, not only for the companies, but I think it's also our responsibility at the regional administration. Now, uh, it, of course, it very much differs um, depending on the size. Large companies are the leaders of change. Large part of them, like example, the zinc or the aluminum processing plants, you can see they are prepared. Yes, the centers, we also have centers plant here in, in Oshvienci, more um, Orlen, um, a large oil company, or Tower of Energy and Energy plants, they are prepared, are preparing, they're developing projects, they have some 
visions and I think a very deep knowledge and insight into the technology option. Uh, much worse situation is within the um, medium-sized companies. And I think that's really wearing very much because that's the, that's the core of the business uh, in this area. Not even to say about micro and small companies, which are generally in a large part not prepared. For. I think it's due to the, really to the um, deficit in, in the awareness and deficit uh, in the in the knowledge, what's the meaning, what's the real meaning of, uh, of the change uh, which is brought by the European Green Deal and that it's a real deep change in the paradigm of, of everything, of the context, of processes, of the way of thinking about the uh, economic activity. So that's, as I said, that's a challenge and that's a concern. We don't know how to, um, how, to how will we, uh, as the regional authorities address the problem, right now we are just uh, we have just collected the information. We start to build a relation with the companies, and and I must only my, might only say at the end that the, that the example of Infor Climate I saw uh, a while ago it really impresses me. I could only wish we do have such a large company in the region which which would like to. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> May I, uh, thank you very much. May I make a mm -hmm. direct uh, comment, please? Mm -hmm. uh, just just to clarify, Info Climate certainly is not a Tusen Group initiative. It's one mm -hmm. which we have been working on together, uh, led by the state uh, with many others. I see. And as far as I see it, you have exactly the right preconditions for doing an info climate yourself. You mentioned mm -hmm. only 12% of your companies mm -hmm. know the way forward in climate. This is exactly the situation we have been mm -hmm. in and we are still in. It's not that we know the way and therefore come together uh, to tell it about. We know where to go, but we don't know how to go there. And this sure. is the why we come together. So InfoClimate is exactly for this 88% uh, uh, that don't yet know where to go. Thank you very much for the comment. Uh, does that mean that the initiative was on the regional authorities, the regional administration side, not the business side, yes? It, um, the history or is... Did, um, did it grow together? <laughs> Uh, as, with, as, with, as with many things, there are several routes. The mm -hmm. most important route, however, and I would like to, to say that because I think it's very important in this context. North Westphalia was the first of the German lender, the German states, that uh, decided to have its own climate law and decided to have a climate action plan together with it. And in order to derive that climate action plan, we did something which hadn't been done before. We basically had a consultative approach. We had a coordination committee of about 40 people from all ways of government, industry, NGOs, churches, and so on and so forth, so really to try to give a mirror of the country. And we developed a climate action plan, so to speak, together. I mean, the main work was on the authorities, but it was a consultative approach. And one of the things we believed is needed was a think tank. It had many different names. It had very different ideas at the beginning, but this is very important. So the whole idea always was a cooperative one and an inclusive one. And this is exactly what uh, then turned into InfoClimate. So I think it's, it's very fair to say, yes, the state has a very important role in it because they actually made the money available, but more importantly, oh. They had a leading figure in the ministry whom they actually said, okay, you are now free to do that for a while. And this has been extremely important because this was really an anchor point, a lighthouse, and at the same time, a motor of the process. Sorry for the a little bit difficult image. Most lighthouses don't move, but in our case, we have a lighthouse <laughs> that really moved around the country and far beyond. Lighthouse, which was a motor, okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, that sounds very interesting. May I comment on that? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, yeah, I'm happy. I, 
I muted myself, but you continue discussing. I knew you would be perfect discussing, but uh, now go ahead, go ahead. It's well, thank you very much. Talking. So um, people say there are no coincidences. So now I, I would say there is not a coincidence that you invited me yesterday to take part in this uh, in this panel today, because I just had to hear that what I have heard, and it's very interesting also because Małopolska region is also the first region in Poland, which. Uh, um, uh, which voted its own climate action plan. So there is something uh, really in common, and maybe we could uh, we could follow on. We I would only add that we do work with a wide range of stakeholders of very different uh, types and groups, also trying to to make it as possible representative of the regional population. Uh, we do work on the regional um, transformation plan, yes, but I think it's a little bit um, narrower than the general strategy of the transformation. Yes, the transformation plan is developed technically for the purpose of the, the JTF, yes, so it's rather found driven. No, it's not the wide general strategy, but maybe that's a good moment to to consider a, a step further and and uh, yeah and develop this uh, this attitude and develop this work and develop this view into something bigger. Because as I said, I think uh, this initiative you presented it, it's very it's interesting, it's impressing and impressive, and I think it's really important and needed. And that's the only uh, also that's the only solution I think working together. Yeah, to, you you have to do it a completely different way now, also in the in the meaning of policy making. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and, and and thank you to you, Mr. Vidig, for pointing this out that from a a strategy development process or the climate law development process, where public consultation or stakeholder consultation was part of it, this initiative evolved. I think that's mm -hmm. important to have in mind how such such a thing can be brought upon. And and how do you how do you find the the those players also in industry in businesses who who want to be the front runners and who want to drive mm -hmm. that initiative? You have, Mr. Verdi, you look like you want to add something more to the discussion. Is that correct? Um, just perhaps a quick, <laughs> quick observation. I think, Belina, where, where you start from might be seen as the other end, something very concrete, very well defined. Um, question of how. To out of money. At the end of the day, it's important that we span the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. because what, what you are saying is let's expand. We did a little bit the opposite by saying let's reduce or let's not reduce, but let's really dive uh, um, deeper. Um, I have shown, albeit only in passing, some of the working groups. We had very lengthy discussions what to do, and you will not be surprised you have a whole wall full of uh, suggestions. But we said it's very important that we actually leave that 30,000 foot uh, level and really go down into the nitty gritties in order to see where it all comes together. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's a right or a wrong. Accidentally, if you like, by historic coincidence, it sounds a little bit more diplomatic, I believe, uh, we started at the strategic level, but I'm pretty sure that uh, that's exactly what we need, like, um, the awareness that we need to span the spectrum. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we only have a few more minutes, but maybe since since you brought this up, uh, Bojena, you you distinguish very much between the bigger companies who have more of a plan and the smaller companies who who are more unsure. But maybe firstly, a quick question to you, Mr. Vediger, is how is how do you see that in North Westphalia? Is are you working with small companies? Is is Info Climate mainly driven by the big ones? And how do the small ones follow? Or is is for the small companies, is maybe a different mm -hmm. tool, a different network, a different support needed? How would you see that? Um, we need all. I mean, as, as I said very briefly, Albert, due to, uh, due to the speed we went through it, we have deliberately a focus also on SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as on startups. Because we do believe we need the breadth and the different views. 
And I mean, it's very difficult. Where do you actually make a distinction? Yes, we have a European Commission definition of an SME, yes. However, for um, we are working in an ecosystem of companies, institutions, whatever else. Uh, take, take a steel plant like Tristan Crook. If we were to freeze uh, the people on the plant uh, in this very moment and would start to count, you will have thousands, I would believe, which are not technically working for Tristan Crook as an employer, but which are working for SMEs and other companies. Um, so it's very important to keep in mind it's that network. Certainly, yes, large companies have the luxury that they often have more resources in terms of people connections available to a little bit drive yeah. that process. But at the end of the day, um, you need to have the whole system. What, what help does it have if you have a very, very strong motor, but you have no tires on your wheels? Mm -hmm. So everything needs to be there in order to actually bring us forward. And SMEs in particular are very important because they're very often rooted in the region. And they are very important because they certainly also act in order to transform ideas to the population perhaps a little bit more than large companies, particularly, which we also have at um, InfoClimate. We have subsidiaries of multinational companies headquartered, I don't know, in Paris or somewhere else. Uh, we are, yes, a global company. If you have an SME that's uh, basically led by its owner, maybe only a dozen people or so, you have certainly a lot of authority in the region, maybe more than if you are just CEO driven 100,000 employee company. And therefore, particularly for such processes, they're extremely important because normally these people have lived in the region and they plan the next generations to stay in the region. So as an anchor point, you can't have anything better than your good SMEs. Yeah, I think that's that's an important point of also where are company decisions made and what is the outreach of a company into a region. There, of course, small or medium-sized companies often are stronger, have a stronger regional route. Um, Bozina, do you have any last statement? Looking at the clock, we've got one, two, three more minutes. But if, if you have a last statement, well, what would be on your heart to say or go um, from Polska region, but also looking into other regions in, in Europe. Anything on your mind? Well, uh, as the last uh, last word, maybe I would say that usually um, working on regional policies, I would rather say let the enterprises, let the companies do what they want. Yeah. Um, we work on some context. We just we focus on the context and uh, they have the, they make their own decisions if there is if it's their responsibility the way they tackle in the context of the energy or climate transformation i would say we have to change yes or uh, even me personally i changed the view i think this is something which needs uh, a really joint effort and also i think it needs a more um, more active uh, involvement of the regional administration because the deficit, the gap in, uh, in different types of resources which companies need to, to, to successfully go through this uh, transformation is too big. I think a large part of them alone, left alone, will not cope. So that's a good feel for cooperation, really. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Verdigat, do you have a, a, a final statement you want to make, something I've not asked, but that's still on your heart and you think it needs to be out there before we close? I don't have a final statement because I think this is all about close. I'm very happy to continue the discussion and hope we will be not only talking about it, but sharing results. So that would be the intermediate statement on that. And uh, let me... Uh, combine that with a lot of thanks for not only your moderation, but particularly the people behind the scenes. And uh, I think it's very important that we do have these discussions because that's what both the company spirit and info family is about. Let's exchange to move things easier forward. They're difficult enough as they are anyhow. Good. Then thank you. Thank you very much uh, for you, Bozena. 
for you, Mr. Wedegit, for, for joining us and discussing. Thank you for all the participants who listened in. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for everyone who was, uh, was there preparing this in the background. Will the presentations be shared afterwards? Yes, we will have a recording. Uh, we'll share presentations. Um, and, and definitely, I think this is a, a discussion that is just, in a way, beginning, uh, especially for us as a, as a co-regions initiative. It's, it's more of a, in a way, a sidetrack, but in a way, not a sidetrack. It, mm -hmm. it is a new topic. And I think this idea of um, becoming on, or moving forward to on our pathway to a zero carbon economy is is obviously the whole of our mm -hmm. of our business environment and 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 bringing that together i think is, is quite a complex uh, pathway from very technical details to questions of governance and cooperation which we've only touched upon and um definitely um we'll continue that discussion one way or another thank you for everyone for joining and um, I'm looking forward to the next event where we have up uh, and possibly to meet again also in person sometime sooner or later.